every time I get involved with talking with the media or read an article about bariatric surgery, it's very apparent that many people do not realize that there are many different types of bariatric surgery and they are all very different. And I think it's important that if we're going to try and use them, we need to understand why they're different. We need to tease apart what bits of them are contributing to their effects, not just on appetite, but also on uh, metabolism and energy expenditure, as we'll see. And then we can maybe try and uh, discover what might be useful in the different uh, causes. So just to run through the four main types, I haven't included on here um, gastric balloons uh, uh, and uh, some of the newer endoscopic devices, but we can maybe mention those uh, in discussion at the end. So there are four main procedures that are used. Uh, the first uh, is laparoscopic gastric banding. In that, there is a tight uh, silastic band put around the proximal stomach with a tube that then goes up and sits under the skin. And then usually, after a, over a few weeks after the surgery, uh, that uh, band is gradually inflated by injecting more and more water into that device to gradually inflate uh, the band and produce more restriction. And basically, you go up until you get to the point where it sort of starts inducing a little bit of nausea or vomiting, and then maybe you, you tail back a little bit. The effect of that is primarily thought to be restrictive, uh, and then there was also an effect potentially on the vagus nerve, which uh, may get uh, altered in its function through pressure from the band. Next one to the right is vertical sleeve gastrectomy, in that basically a portion of the stomach is just effectively removed, so you now have a tube-like stomach. That is not restrictive. It has some effects, as we'll see on the next slide, where have hormones uh, and appetite and metabolism is not a restrictive procedure. That is uh, a little bit more involved than the uh, laparoscopic gastric banding, but uh, probably a little bit easier to perform in the very morbidly obese compared to the rather more invasive procedure of the rural and white gastric bypass. Rural and white gastric bypass is a very complex procedure. There's at least five or six different components to it. The first is the uh, formation of a very small gastric pouch about the size of your thumb, which is then joined to a loop of small bowel which is brought up to it, thereby bypassing the majority of the stomach from food. There is not a restrictive element to that, which is a mistake many people think. The food can pass relatively easily through that pouch into the small bowel. What it does mean is that food does not go into the proximal small bowel, duodenum, so there is food exclusion, and that is increasingly being shown to potentially have a very major uh, part in its beneficial effects. And the food is very early introduced into the uh, distal small bowel. Bile salts, which are produced uh, from the biliary system going into the small, uh, proximal small bowel, also are affected because uh, they're not mixed with the uh, food as much because they're uh, uh, going straight through into that blind, uh, into that loop that doesn't see the food. Generally, and this is another misconception, there is not malabsorption in this procedure. There is some need often for some uh, addition of vitamin, particularly fat-soluble vitamins. But the length of small bowel that is left is usually sufficient to cause uh, adequate absorption. So again, that's a common error. People think that this is a malabsorptive procedure. It is not. There is variation in the size of the limb of proximal small bowel that's used that may have some changes, but generally it's not a malabsorptive procedure. That procedure is the sort of... Uh, Next one, the biliopancreatic uh, diversion, which is basically rural and white gastric bypass plus, in which the loop of bowel coming uh, up to meet the stomach uh, comes from a very much more distal portion, so you're basically bypassing an awful lot of the small bowel, and that procedure does cause malabsorption. So they're very different procedures. They have differing uh, uh, magnitudes of effect. Generally, this is from the Swedish... Uh, uh, BC study now, which has been following people up for 10, uh, 15 years. This is obviously not genetic or hypothalamic obesity. Um, gastric bypass producing sort of 25% uh, on average going out to 15 years weight loss. Uh, gastric banding uh, producing uh, sort of initially maybe 15, 20, but settling at about 10. Uh, sleeve gastrectomy is somewhere in the middle, sort of around 15 to 20. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, pancreas Billy pancreatic diversion, probably similar to the gastric bypass. One thing to note, as Christian will talk about later, 
there are large error bars here. So although generally people respond, there is huge individual variation, which we don't necessarily understand. Um, and sometimes there are both initial failures, and also there are people who relapse. So they lose initial weight, and then they gain weight after, and that's particularly seen with gastric banding, and again, we don't necessarily know the reasons for that, um, and, and uh, that's the point. So uh, this is a, a slide I've adapted. Uh, please read uh, Randy Seeley's excellent recent review and endocrine reviews, um, summarizing the effects of these different procedures, and they are very, very different in their effects. So just to give some highlights, um, they all generally produce a reduction in hunger and satiety, which is probably reasonably similar. They can produce weight-independent improvements in diabetes. That's particularly uh, true for rheum gastric bypass and uh, pancreatic biliary diversion, not so much for uh, ga uh, gastric banding, maybe a little bit for vertical sleep gastrectomy. That does have important implications because it does mean that even if some of these uh, treatments are not suitable for certain genetic hypothalamic obesity, they may be suitable for the treatment of diabetes. And there are studies now going to be going on to use these primarily as treatments for diabetes associated with obesity rather than for the obesity themselves. Um, as I talked about, gastric restriction is really only seen in the gastric banding. Gastric emptying uh, is probably only reduced in the gastric banding. Malabsorption, as I said, is only really seen in the pancreatic biliary diversion. The vagus nerve may well be involved and affected in some of these procedures. It may depend on the exact surgeries, whether the vagus nerve is transected and where it's transected, but that may play a part in the physiology as well. Um, removal of food from the duodenum is probably very important, uh, particularly in the improvement in the diabetes, and that's seen in um, the uh, rheumatoid gastric bypass and the pancreatic biliary diversion. There's a newer device called the endobarrier, which is a plastic tube that sits in the proximal duodenum to mimic that bit of the gastric bypass. And that's been trialed as some benefit for maybe some weight loss and diabetes. I've talked to my colleagues in my institution who are using this device. They're very worried about using it in hyperphagia. They've seen it in people with binge eating disorder and used it, and it, there was a risk of migration of the device, which is then quite difficult to get out as it migrates down the um, duodenum. It, these things can be left in for six to 12 months. I think we need more research to know. Is there a potentially possibility to avoid the surgery, but I, it may be that in hyperphagic conditions, because of that risk of migration, they may not be suitable. Uh, people have argued whether ghrelin levels are altered. The natural response to weight loss is for ghrelin to go up, and that probably explains the, the situation in gastric banding. There are debates about whether they go down with some of the other procedures. There's variable evidence in the literature, but when you measure the active ghrelin, uh, the acylated ghrelin, there do not seem to be great changes uh, in that, and Randy's going to discuss some more uh, in his talk, little section about the role of ghrelin in mediating that. An important feature of the response to particularly gastric banding, uh, gastric bypass and biliary pancreatic diversion, and probably also sleeve gastrectomy, is the very large increase in GLP-1 and PYY, anorexogenic hormones, that occurs early after ingestion of food, because the food's getting very quickly to the distal small bowel and large bowel, where the secretions, you get a very early exaggerated increase. You also get altered bile acid metabolism, and bile acids uh, stimulate uh, release of GLP-1 and PYY as well. And we believe those have a very significant uh, uh, effect in, in causing the increased satiety after the uh, uh, things. There are subtle changes in dietary uh, preferences um, in that there seems to be a reduction in uh, interest in fat after certain of the procedures, particularly fat and sugar after the bypass. And I'll show you a little bit of data of that. Patients after banding find it very difficult to eat things like bread and pizza because of the very uh, tight restriction that causes a problem. But they do seem to overcompensate by drinking fizzy drinks, which can easily get, get through. There are some interesting potential changes in food reward and hedonics. I'm going to show some of our brain imaging and behavioral work that suggests that. Um, the, there may be some aversive-like symptoms. Um, so particularly after gastric bypass, some people get a sort of dumping syndrome where they can have feelings of unwell, drops of blood pressure, sweating, nausea, abdominal discomfort after particularly eating fatty foods. That often settles, but it may be a sort of a learned aversion in the short period after um, uh, surgery. And patients with gastric banding can often have quite disruptive problems with vomiting, particularly if the band is too tight, which can cause a problem. Uh, the effects of these procedures on energy expenditure are, are complicated and not always consistent, but there may be additional effects on energy expenditure that may vary from procedure to procedure. And like, the other thing I also haven't mentioned is taste. And there is some evidence to suggest, particularly with gastric bypass, that patients report marked alterations in taste. 
um, and that they don't like the taste of fatty and sweet foods anymore. And some subtle changes in taste sensitivity have been found. So just to give you an example of how these procedures can differ, just from a, a recent study we've been doing in our group, um, comparing the effects of gastric banding and gastric bypass on uh, eating behavior, and particularly food reward. So we've studied cross-sectionally people after gastric binding or gastric bypass who are BMI matched. Um, they're, they're studied sort of several months after at a weight-stable state, and we've compared them to a group of BMI matched uh, controls. Both the banding and the bypass groups are equally uh, unhungry. This is in the fasted state, and when they eat ice cream to satiation, they have a similar reduction in hunger. So in terms of hunger and satiety, the two groups are pretty well matched, uh, and are less than the controls. These are their hormones, so they come in fasted, they have an MRI scan, which I'll show you the results of later, and after they come out of the MRI, we give them pots of ice cream uh, in small amounts and say, you can have one every five minutes, eat as much as you want until you're full. And as you can see, uh, the PYY uh, levels, there's a tendency for them to be a bit higher fasted, and then after the, the ice cream, the uh, gastric bypass uh, patients have a very large increase in PYY, which doesn't have it happen in the banding group. Uh, similarly, the GLP-1 levels uh, uh, increased dramatically after ingestion of food. Ghrelin levels were no different. There was a tendency for them to be a little bit higher in the uh, uh, unoperated group, but generally they were the same. And bile acids also uh, raised fasting and also after food in the gastric bypass compared to the banding group. In the scanner, we asked the people to rate how appealing they find the food pictures, and we find that there is a selective reduction in the appeal of high-calorie foods in patients after gastric bypass compared to gastric banding, and that goes across the board to chocolate, sweet and savory, high-calorie foods. So the difference in food hedonics between the bypass and banding patients. When we put them in the scanner and look at their brain activation to food pictures, we find that several areas of the brain in the bypass patients show less activation to the high-calorie foods compared to the banding patients, despite them being similarly unhungry. Uh, those include the orbital frontal cortex, uh, the ventral striatum, the chordate, and the amygdala. And on a region of interest uh, analysis, we find in the anterior orbital frontal cortex, the bypass patients have reduced activation compared to the banding patients in hatched. Interestingly, that seems to be for both high calorie and low calorie. And similarly, in the amygdala, which encodes emotional responses, um, we find reduced activation in the bypass patients. When we give them ice cream, we ask them how much they liked it, and we also find that the bypass patients uh, find the uh, ice cream much less pleasant uh, to eat. That may be a partly a learned uh, experience. Retrospective dumping syndrome symptom scores are higher in the bypass patients as well. And this is also uh, goes to behavior. Alex Miras and our group did a study. So this is a human progressive ratio lever pressing task. And the uh, patients were asked to press a mouse button on a keyboard, which exponentially increased in order to earn chocolate M&Ms. And we find that uh, compared to before uh, gastric bypass surgery, the patients are prepared to work much less for uh, M&Ms, uh, but there's no change uh, as an order effect in controls, and they don't uh, change at all for how much they're prepared to work for vegetables. Um, and although we haven't got it here, the gastric banding patients in the few that we did did not seem to reduce their work that they would be prepared to do for banding, uh, for, for, for the food. So there are inherent differences in these two treatments for um, uh, uh, effects on food reward. So where are we in this matrix at the moment? And we'll hear about this more. So on the top, we've got our four procedures. Down the bottom, we've got our various um, causes of hyperphagia, and we've got a way to go to fill in the gap. So there's a little bit in binge eating. There's a very nice review from Diego in 2007 in the International Journal of um, Eating Disorders, reviewing does binge eating disorder negatively impact on the outcome from bariatric surgery. And there are some suggestions that it may do. However, it's certainly not universal, and we certainly see patients in our clinic who uh, have the surgery without any psychological intervention for their binge eating, and it seems to get better. But the general recommendation would be that you try and address the binge eating disorder before you, uh, psychologically before you embark on the surgery. We'll hear some more about craniopharyngioma later, prada willi syndrome, um, lots of case reports, which Anne is going to review, um, Christian is going to review the evidence about melanocortin-4 receptor mutations and the one case of a leptin receptor mutation. Of course, this is all very well. We've got a diagnosed uh, cause, but we have lots of obese children who come along uh, or adolescents with early onset morbid obesity, and we don't know the genetic cause. What about them? And there's a number of studies going on, some of which will integrate eventually with genetic um, analyses. So the Swedish have a, a, a gastric banding study which will report. There's a big work going on in Saudi Arabia, and there's a recent paper, again, in Annals of Surgery about that. There are some criticisms I think Anne may cover about the degree of follow-up for that, uh, and we're hoping we can get some more data out of them. And uh, Thomas Inge is going to talk, uh, I think, briefly about the uh, teen labs uh, study going on in the US uh, to, to look at this. Um, 
there are some suggestions, small studies so far, that some common genetic variants of the sort that we heard about from uh, Ruth earlier this morning may impact on the uh, uh, response. Interesting, there's a suggestion that the FTO uh, SNP may negatively influence the response to banding, but not influence uh, the response to bypass. But these studies are still very small, and we really need to see uh, whether this is going to be in any way useful for personalized medicine. We don't, I think there's one case of body beetle um, that's been treated, reported, but we don't know about the others. And maybe the future may also be uh, to use animal models, uh, and Randy will talk a little bit about that uh, later, um, uh, some evidence that PYY, knocking out the PYY system reduces the effectiveness of gastric uh, bypass. So hopefully over the time we'll be able to fill in these gaps and be able to individualize our treatment a little bit more. So good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Tony, for inviting me and for organizing the debate and actually for organizing a Skype conference to organize the debate before, uh, beforehand. Um, so uh, I think you've already given a bit nice introduction. I'm actually not sure that it, is, uh, uh, it makes for a very uh, uh, smooth debate to, for a Brit to invite a half French, half German, but you know, we'll see that. Uh, <laughs> so much for disclosure of my accent. Um, so uh, the questions I wanted to, to discuss today were first the question that I were actually asked to discuss, which is that um, uh, the clinical questions of being faced with a patient um, who has one of those uh, known mutations or known syndrome of obesity and uh, uh, asking the questions if those carriers of obesity causing mutation have a different outcome after bariatric surgery and should, we, should actually some uh, patients be excluded from, from bariatric surgery. Now, the other question that I think is in the back that Tony didn't want me to uh, address is more of a biological question. And, and what really, can we, is the integrity uh, of the leptin mineral coding pathway necessary for a normal response to bariatric surgery? And, and that ca ca question uh, relates more to the fact that we really don't know how bariatric surgery works. We know it works very well, but we don't know how it works. And, and maybe if we get, uh, uh, patients that, for which we know what the defect is, respond differentially to uh, bariatric surgery. This could give us some ideas on how bariatric surgery actually works. So um, th the reason why we can actually even ask these questions is, as, uh, as Tony uh, introduced earlier, is that actually uh, not everybody, uh, gastric bypass surgery works very well, but not everybody responds the same. And in particular, there are some patients on a long-term follow-up, who actually do not respond. About 10 to 20 percent of patients don't respond well to bariatric surgery. So there are different possibilities here. I mean, there could be environmental reasons. There could be um, uh, psychological reasons. Um, uh, or there could be um, uh, genetic reasons. And that has actually been uh, uh, suggested. And um, so, so if we think about genetic study, genetics, uh, genetic reasons, then the ones we would first consider would be the ones that actually would predispose to the obesity in the first place. So this is to follow up a little bit on, on a couple of talks we've, fall, we've seen uh, this morning. Um, obesity is basically uh, a typical genetic uh, complex trait with uh, rare allele ca causing uh, Mendelian diseases, which is the ones I'm going to talk to you about today, and then common variants uh, uh, that are more frequent in the population but have a very modest effect on the disease. And so uh, one of the questions right now in the field, I guess, is, well, how much are each of these actually account for? But to go back to, uh, to the examples that I'm going to discuss today, uh, the mutations in the... Um, uh, the mutations in the leptin mineral axis. So, um, so the axis has been presented before, um, and actually it turns out that all um, severe, uh, all mutations, rare mutations causing severe obesity in humans are actually part of that leptin mineral axis. Uh, I didn't mention SIM1 that was discussed by Andrew earlier, but I think you've, gonna, you've seen enough evidence from him that uh, SIM1 acts probably at close to the, to the uh, MC4R. So we have characterized a couple of patients uh, during the past uh, 10, 15 years, uh, and, and those patients have either mutation in the leptin gene, leptin receptor gene, we were the first one to describe those, mutation in POMC genes, 
and uh, a number of mutations, uh, a number of patients with mutation in the MC4R gene. However, uh, I want to really say that there's a different situation here for the clinician. Um, first, um, the mutation in the leptin, leptin receptor of POMC uh, are actually extremely rare, right? So I think these numbers might be a little low. For POMC, there are eight patients that have been described in eight families, right? Uh, those mutations, those, those uh, diseases are rare. They're all recessive, so you need to have two alleles that are completely, of which the function is completely abolished to actually have the disease, uh, to have the condition. And these conditions are also most often associated with other uh, typical uh, uh, features such as ACTH deficiency. Uh, for leptin and leptin receptor mutation, uh, again, very few families. I think there's a little more now, maybe 15 families, 30 patients for the leptin receptor. Uh, also, uh, this is not your typical obesity since it also includes hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Uh, a difference here is mutation in the MC4R gene. And with, I think um, we had some talks by Leslie this morning about this in, in her population. But again, uh, MC4R mutations come in two, variant, two, two, two ways. Either homozygous, so the two alleles are completely gone and the gene is gone, uh, the product is gone. This is also very rare. This is also as rare probably as the other syndromes, right? Um, uh, the difference with them, though, is that it, is, it only causes uh, severe obesity without other, any other uh, feature. Now, the more clinically relevant, in a way, is our MC4R heterozygous mutation. Why? Because they probably are causal of 2.5% of severe obesity in humans. Right? They're dominant. Only one allele is mutated. So these patients still have a normal allele. And the uh, obesity can be severe, uh, can be early or late onset, and the severity at, at, as well as the onset actually depends on the nature of the mutation. So what have these mutations already ta taught us? Um, they told us that the leptin mimicoin pathway is essential for body weight regulation in humans, right? Um, that they've told us that obesity can be genetically determined. This is probably obvious for, this crowd, for, for people working on PWS, but the fact that common obesity can actually have a genetic uh, underpinning uh, really was only uh, proven and, and, and sort of became more, more notorious when those first mutations were described. Um, the genetic predisposition in, to obesity in one individual can be linked to mutation in a single gene. And the knowledge of the underlying mutation can permit treatment of obesity. And here I want to go back indeed to, uh, uh, to something that, that Tony said before. What are the treatment that, to two treatments that can actually cure severe obesity? Right? I think we're talking about one right now, which is uh, bariatric surgery. Uh, and we talk more about it, but the other one is leptin. Well, leptin is a treatment that actually can treat severe obesity. Now, of course, it only treats severe obesity in those patients that have mutation in the uh, leptin gene, but what is that other than actually knowing the genetic cause of that obesity, right? So when you know the genetic cause of an obesity, you may be able to have a treatment that's appropriate. The question is, uh, is bariatric surgery appropriate? So the first uh, studies I'm going to talk about uh, is the following. Ducarius of heterozygous MC4 mutation have a different clinical outcome after bariatric surgery. Uh, does, complete MC, uh, uh, does complete MC4 deficiency impair the response to bariatric surgery? And does complete leptin signaling deficiency impair the response to bariatric surgery? So the first uh, one, Ducarius of heterozygous MC4 mutation have a different clinical outcome after bariatric surgery. So these studies are a little bit easier because there are more patients in the population and therefore you can actually uh, more easily build those studies. So just a reminder, um, uh, these, these are, again, uh, mutations affect this g uh, g cup receptor MC4R. Uh, they are uh, dominant. So here's a family where every, uh, uh, where every patient is heterozygous before the mutation, and they cause uh, uh, severe obesity. Here, the pro problem had a BMI of 57. Uh, they are uh, 
not only uh, is there 2.5 percent of the population that have that of the severely obese patients that have a mutation MC4R, but all these mutations are different, right? They only have one; they have one normal allele, one mutation, and all have a different mutation, which might have different effect on the on the protein. What are, what is the actual prevalence? Uh, this is a, a large. Um, analysis of a number of studies where in children where, they, where the uh, uh, average of mutation was 3% over a large number of studies and what we, we know is actually is that the, the prevalence of these, uh, of these uh, mutation uh, is proportional to the actual is, is associated with actually the, the BMI cutoff that is chosen for uh, screening for those mutations. So higher the, the cutoff, more uh, mutation you will find. Uh, in adults, the prevalence over multiple cord is about uh, 2%. So in a pilot study, we uh, uh, looked at 92 patients who underwent renal gastric bypass, and we screened for uh, MC4R mutations. We found uh, four uh, patients carrying uh, three patients carrying, uh, uh, excuse me, four patients were ca carrying uh, three different heterozygous mutations, which we functionally tested and which impaired completely the function of the of the protein. Now, here is the uh, percent of excess body weight loss uh, after uh, one year. Uh, in uh, red, the MC4R heterozygous mutation carriers. In yellow, in green, uh, matched controls from the cohort. Uh, match for sex, age, and BMI, and uh, in blue, the average of the uh, general cohort. So I think it's clear to, for, from that, for at least uh, in, in the short term, uh, that there is really no differences in response to bariatric surgery uh, uh, for uh, heterozygous carriers of MC4R mutation. Now, uh, with this preliminary data, it suggests that patients with heterozygous MC4 mutation ben benefit from ruin y gastric bypass surgery. We have started a follow-up study where uh, we actually use the LAPS cohort, 2,400 patients undergoing bariatric surgery in four centers, with extensive initial phenotyping and five-year follow-up uh, sy to systematically sequence the MC4R gene, compare phenotype of cars and non-cars at baseline, compare outcome of MC4R mutation carriers and non-carriers, and within MC4R mutation carriers, uh, look at the outcome related to the functional characteristics of the mutation. Now, as um, we actually did our part of the work here, uh, which is to characterize, to find, to, to sequence the gene and find mutation, and we find uh, uh, 25 functionally relevant heterozygous MC4R mutation in, oops, Yes. So uh, we find 25 mutations in this cohort, which is about 1.5%. Uh, now, unfortunately, we did the par our part of the deal, but uh, labs did not their part of the deal, which is to release their data, because they're still, uh, they've done the, the, the finished the work, but in order to release the data, they want to first publish them. So we are waiting for that to actually come. But in the meantime, there's another study that came out um, that was part of a larger paper uh, uh, discussing uh, this issue, which used, uh, which used 972 patients undergoing uh, ruin Y. And in this patient, 15 patients uh, had a pathogenic uh, MC4R mutation. Um, and after ruin Y gastric bypass uh, in this cohort, patients with either pathogenic or non-pathogenic mutations lost similar amount of weights as patients without MC4R mutation. So basically the way the data was presented here is to look at the distribution of uh, percent excess body weight loss in the three group of pathogenic mutation carriers, which is what we would look at here, and the patients with no mutation and find that the distribution was exactly the same. And indeed, the evolution of the uh, weight over 40 months was actually the same in the, uh, of the uh, percent excess body weight loss was the same in the three cohorts. So again, um, again, uh, 
demonstrating, uh, showing that if you have patients who have heterozygous MC4R mutation, there's really no reason to think that they would not benefit from, uh, from bioetic surgery. Now, another question is, does complete MC4R deficiency impair the response to bioetic surgery? So here the question is, is it necessary to have at least one copy of MC4R to, uh, to respond? And so, um, how are, the pa how are these patients uh, different? Um, not much, actually. Um, so here's an example of one of the patients, one, one patient that uh, we described initially with, was the first one with a homozygous uh, null mutation in the receptor, and he had two uh, SIBs who were heterozygous. And what you can see in the weight curves is, here's the weight curve of a patient with a homozygous, uh, BM, uh, uh, BMI curve of a patient with a homozygous MC4R mutation, and here are the cur curves of the two SIBs with the 99th percentile being, being here. So these patients will eventually uh, become severely obese, but there is, there is a shift in, in the degree of the severity and the uh, early onset of the severity in this patient. But again, homozygous carriers do not have uh, uh, other phenotypes than the obesity. So uh, what we had, the case I'm showing here is, again, uh, this is clinical cases, so you go with what you have and what was done. So this is an 18-year-old male with severe obesity uh, presented with hyperphagia and excessive weight gain from six months, to, from six months of age. And uh, at age 18, his uh, weight was uh, 143 and BMI and 47, and here is his uh, weight curve. And so this patient actually, uh, we sequenced the MC4R of this patient, and he basically had two different mutations one being an insertion and one being a frame shift, which made it a little bit more complicated. But after sequencing his parents, cloning the DNA, et cetera, et cetera, we basically demonstrated that this patient had two mutations, uh, which we then uh, studied functionally. And here's the, uh, again, you've seen functional study this morning from Leslie. So here is the normal, the response of a normal MC4R to, uh, to an activator. And here's the response of this two mutations uh, one is a frame shift mutation, and the other one is a, is a deletion of, of one amino acid. So again, this patient is completely null with response to M with, 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 uh, uh, MC4, with respect to MC4R signaling. So uh, the patient underwent uh, laparoscop adjust laparoscopic adjustable gastric bending at age 18. Uh, bariatric surgery resulted in no weight loss. The patient gained 6.5 kilograms 12 months after surgery. And here's the curve of the patient, and this is where uh, the, 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 bio, the, um, uh, the gastric banding was, was put in place. So what does this suggest? Although uh, there are lots of caveats in this particular case, but I think the first suggestion here would be that complete MC4R deficiency may impair response to gastric banding, and that the presence of at least one functional MC4R allele might be necessary for weight loss. So I would like to, uh, to relate this to a recent study that has been done in mice this time. So uh, this is a study by Hadoum et al., where they actually used a, a procedure in mice that, was actually, that is actually pretty similar than the UNY procedure used uh, in humans. And what they did is, in this first experiment, they actually fed uh, uh, mice uh, Operated, operated on, on mice fed high fat diet and um, looked at uh, the results. Um, so here, uh, sham operated uh, mice, and here, mice operated uh, after with uh, the UNY procedure. And they then did the, and so there is definitely an effect of that surgery here. And then they looked at the same thing in mice missing the MC4R, right, with obese without MC4R. And in this first case, they found no, uh, very little or no difference between the uh, sham operated and the uh, mice receiving the procedure. And in the second one, where they actually had a background that was a little closer than that, probably that was asked by the reviewer, they still uh, could only see a, a, a mi minor difference in both. So again, this is, this is experiments that you can do in mice, right? having a lot of MC4 on all. And so uh, in this case, it does seem to, this does seem to indicate that loss of MC4 indeed impairs response to bariatric surgery. 
Now, in the long term, it was very clear um, that after one year, uh, the uh, Ruin Y worked in the Y type mice but did not work in the homozygous mutant mice. Um, in the same paper, there was a similar experiment, but done with a diff bit of a different, uh, bit of a different uh, surgery. And in this experiment, uh, mice were uh, first um, had first surgery, and then after surgery, at one point, uh, uh, a, a, a choice of diet was introduced. And so, this is a little bit difficult to follow. But if you look at the at a wild type sham operated mouse. Uh, here's the operation. This is the green one here. So here's the operation. And when you introduce the diet, the mouse actually just eats normally and gains weight. Now, this is prevented by the bariatric surgery seen here. Right? In, the, in this dashed green line. Now, if you take um, heterozygous mice, for MC4R, uh, the same is true. You can see that uh, the sham operated here uh, gain weight after gain weight, while the ones that had the surgery do not gain weight at all. Finally, in uh, mice that were homozygous null, actually uh, the surgery did not work as well because after the surgery the mice lose weight, but then they gain the weight again, or slot gaining weight again, be, this being another argument saying that, at least in this system, uh, both Y-type and, and, and heterozygous mice respond uh, to bariatric surgery, but mutant mice do not. So again, uh, from this data, Y-type and heterozygous MC4R uh, plus minus mice respond to bariatric surgery, bariatric surgery in this case being different uh, uh, Y procedure, why MC4R minus minus mice are resistant to so this seemed to suggest that MC4R signaling is required for the success of bariatric surgery in mice and humans. And again, there's a lot of ifs here because it's only a few cases. So um, what does, it, does this actually mean that we are in a situation where, um, where the entire leptin system, uh, is, the integrity of the leptin system is actually necessary for bariatric surgery to work? Um, and that what we have actually, the, the patient in which it doesn't work, it might be patients that are all missing uh, something. So, so, um, so I'm going to give you another, ex another example that's, that's not published yet, that was just sent to me by, uh, by Karine Clément, my colleague in France, uh, where she looks, at, where he asks the question, uh, does leptin signaling, uh, does leptin signaling, uh, does leptin signaling deficiency impair the response to bariatric surgery? And so this is the case of a patient with a homozygous mutation in the leptin receptor. Uh, this patient is, uh, is here, BMI of 45 um, uh, at age 16. And basically to make, uh, so he is, uh, so to make the genetic uh, more complicated, he has actually an isodisomy of uh, a paternal uh, chromosome 1 that has a heterozygous mutation. But he's still homozygous for uh, a leptin receptor mutation. And this is shown here in the next slide where he actually shows homozygosity for that uh, mutation. And this mutation imp uh, impairs uh, uh, the sequence in, in uh, exon 13, creates a frame shift that basically leads to a truncated protein after exon 14 out of uh, X in, uh, 18 exons. So this patient, which has no leptin receptor, no leptin signaling, uh, underwent gastroplast gas gastroplasty by adjustable gastric banding at age 16 uh, uh, with a weight at 164 kilograms, which resulted in a significant weight loss of 46 kilograms. Following slippage, the band was removed, resulting in immediate weight regain. And he had a second gastroplasty at age 18, which resulted again in significant weight loss that was sustained after eight years. So here's the curve. Uh, here is uh, uh, trying uh, food restriction. Uh, here's the, the weight. Here's the first gastroplasty. Here's the weight loss. Here's the weight regain after, putting, after removing the band. 
and here's the again the weight loss and the sustained weight loss. Now this was actually this is actually represented here in yellow. Uh, with in gray, I represented uh, the average result for the same surgery for uh, 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 more than uh, 50 uh, patients. Now. I have added something here. There's something added here that, that I, I should also talk about, which is this red and, 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 and black curve. So this red curve actually corresponds to the result of uh, RU and Y gastric bypass, gastric bypass surgery in another leptin receptor mutant, a, a female. Uh, and this is compared to um, actual the result of that surgery in this cohort in 200 uh, uh, patients. So from this, it seems that actually um, missing leptin receptor might actually not work that, that well uh, in response to leptin uh, to uh, uh, ruin Y biopic surgery. But again, the difficulty here is a very few cases. So I think it will be important that every case be actually documented and published in some sort of way. So now, what, what could we say, though, if we're going back to the, bi to the biology? Um, if it is indeed true that uh, uh, biotic surgery does not work uh, in patients who have MC4R mutation, but does work in patients with leptin, who have no leptin receptor, this might indicate to us or give an indication that maybe biotic surgery the effect of biotic surgery on, on weight loss is somewhere between these two. So somewhere in the, at the beginning of the leptin melocortin pathway, either uh, 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 maybe acting on the uh, first order neuron on which leptin acts. So in summary, uh, biotic surgery could be an appropriate treatment option for patients with known genetic cause of obesity and should be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. Additional case observation will be necessary to confirm the difference in outcome of MC4R null versus leptin receptor null patients. These observations may, in aggregate, provide novel biological insights into the mechanism of action of biotic surgery. And here are the people who did the work, and special thanks for Karin Clément for, to, give him, to give me some uh, uh, idea about uh, a paper that is still in review. Thank you. Good afternoon. Usually when I speak, it's usually around the time people are eating, so um, I'm glad that's not happening right now. Um, I have three disclosures today. The first one is I wanted to thank the conference organizers um, and the Prader Willi Syndrome Association, in addition to the Pennington Institute, for the, the privilege of being able to speak at this conference. Uh, so that's disclosure number one. Um, disclosure number two is that I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. I'm not a surgeon. And my final disclosure is that, yes, I am short, and I do like to eat, but I do not have prader willi syndrome or hyperphagic disorder. So I am uh, assigned to give you the con um, uh, on outcomes of bariatric procedures and hyperphagic disorders, and I will do my best to present things in as fair a way as possible. So I wanted to start first, since there's been a fair amount of background given on prader willi syndrome, in addition to some of the other disorders, as far as the genetics and the clinical features, by covering some data that I pulled together um, from looking at a variety of different published death series, both from the prader willi syndrome association, from a group in the United Kingdom, from France, from uh, Belgium, from Japan, and from over in Australia. And this gives you a few interesting points in a disorder that's characterized by obesity. What you can see from this slide is that there's some things you would expect to see here, that there'd be some deaths from, from uh, congestive heart failure and complications of that. There's some pulmonary emboli, some deaths from pneumonia, some choking, and we've heard about the hyperphagia, in addition to deaths attributed to core pulmonary and respiratory failure. Kind of pretty typical, but I think one thing that sticks out is the, uh, the, the prevalence of GI disorders in, in this uh, series of patients that have significant obesity, which should be mentioned, um, and it'll be important as we look at uh, patients that have bariatric procedures. Uh, since I only had, I was told I had about 22 slides, I also didn't put in some other background things, but I wanted to mention also very briefly that if you look at the uh, life expectancy and the mortality times for prader willi syndrome, there are essentially four key times when children with prader willi syndrome die. They die during the first year of life, typically to complications of prematurity. 
They die between about one and four years of age. Some of that's probably related to aspiration events or pneumonias and infections, and some of that may be from adrenal insufficiency. And then there is a large number of children that will pass away between about eight years of age and 14 or 15 that we struggle with what we're going to do with them. Most of them have BMIs that are at least 300% of the ideal body weight. And then lastly, if you get through that curve, if you're not that obese, your, your life expectancy is actually uh, probably into your mid-20s or into your 30s and 40s. Um, so that kind of gives you the perspective of what's different about this disorder as far as causes of death and a disorder that's known to contribute to obesity and the different time frames that we see uh, mortality and why bariatric surgery becomes an issue in, this, in patients in this population and why it's been fairly reasonably studied. If you look at the salient features of GI function in Prader-Willi syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome patients, that's the purpose of this conference in addition to the whole conference with the other disorders, that they have an underlying defect in satiety. They have an altered pain threshold. They have a decreased ability to vomit. Anyone that takes care of patients with Prader Willi syndrome or any families in the audience will tell you that other, fa other family members will develop gastroenteritis and will have vomiting and diarrhea. But the child with Prader Willi syndrome may eat a little bit less but will not throw up. And it's caused patients to go to the emergency room with overdoses of digoxin and other medications. In addition to gummy vitamins, I had a child last week when I did my Prader Willi syndrome clinic that took all of their sister's princess gummy vitamins. They called poison control, fortunately, because it was the Disney Pristus one that had the FDA caution and has a class action lawsuit. There were no micronutrients in there aside from the gummy vitamins, and the child was fine. <laughs> there is also a risk for gastric dilatation and necrosis that's been well published, uh, initially by Robert Wharton in 1997 in a series of about seven patients be between the ages of five to about 27. About half of them resolved, some of them went on to perforation. And when David Stevenson and I reviewed in the journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition in 2006, a number of cases of the deaths in prader willi syndrome, there were a number of patients that had passed away from that. And these are, again, things that would be different about prader willi syndrome versus other causes of morbid obesity. So now, I, this is, was covered beautifully by Tony, although I have a little bit of a discrepancy about what's restrictive and what's not for being a GI person and dealing with microgastria. So I'm going to say that restrictive procedures, he didn't cover intraluminal, which there is um, a balloon that can be placed temporarily in the stomach. And I'm going to throw in um, using the sleeve because it does cause some microgastria. So probably a little bit of restriction um, as a cause of having some restriction in addition to um, discussing very briefly the, the band of gastroplasty that was done in the past, along with laparoscopic banding that's more commonly done now. So I'm going to lump all of these procedures together with some degree of restriction. And when I mention malabsorptive procedures, I am going to mention gastric bypass because there is an element of dumping from carbohydrate malabsorption that occurs with gastric bypass. Um, as you go through the small bowel, you're losing the pyloric, the break of the pylorus, and you're dumping more quickly carbohydrates into the proximal jejunum. And there are two types of uh, biliopancreatic diversions that have been done in prader willi syndrome. There is the classic diversion, which is here, where you see the stomach um, with a loop of small bowel brought into the ileum. And there's also a more recent one that's been published in a few cases in Europe, where they've actually left um, the remnant of the stomach with the pylorus present um, to give you some exposure of the proximal bowel um, to uh, micronutrients. That would, this is the duodenal switch here. It looks like a complicated highway, but there is a little more exposure there and some more regulation. Okay, and I don't have a picture up here of the jejunal ileal bypass. This was done in prader willi syndrome back in the 70s, but it's now long, no longer done in any cases, but I will review the data for jejunal ileal bypass. So if we actually look, if we look at the cases that have been reported in prader willi syndrome, these are the number of subjects, and you can see the overall number for a disorder that has an incidence of about one in 10,000 is small. Um, but if you will look at how many patients now, Dr. Ng is going to talk in a little bit about how many adolescents have had uh, bariatric surgery versus how many adolescents are morbidly obese. The numbers are reasonably small as well. Um, there have been a total of three patients who have had jejunal ileal bypass, about 15 reported with gastric bypass, with a gastroplasty approximately five, with a band one, which is good because I'll show you why. It shouldn't be any more than that. 25 had biliopancreatic diversion. There was one vagotomy done in the late 70s. There have 
was a series of 12 patients who had a balloon placed as a temporizing measure to help with weight loss out of Italy. And sleeve gastrectomy has been reported in a total of nine patients. If we go through the experience, because I always say, show me the data. Uh, the, here's the experience for restrictive procedures in prader syndrome. In 1974, SOPR published in gas, a gastroplasty series. With a small number, there were a total of four patients in the series that had prader willi syndrome. He reported a 43% success rate, but 60% of the patients required revision for weight. In 1980, Anderson reported a series of 10 patients with prader willi syndrome who had gastric bypass, one who had a gastroplasty. Um, there was no long-term weight data reported other than he reported success. There was one wound infection, 54% of them required revision of the operation due to weight gain. Uh, there was one dumping and one death from uh, attributed to weight and complications. So out of that population of 11, we have six here who probably didn't lose a lot of weight, or more than half. Um, in 81, Fonxaru tried it, uh, vagotomy and found within six months there was 30 kilograms of initial weight loss, followed rapidly by 20 kilograms of weight, of weight gain. Sounds reminiscent of what Christian just prep, uh, presented in the melanocortin patient. With banded gastroplasty, there was a series of seven patients who had um, weight loss, then they broke the... Uh, the anastomosis, and they had a nice picture in their paper uh, showing the rupture, followed by rate began. This is the patient that had laparoscopic gastric banding. It was done by a gastroenterologist, an adult person, not a peds, in 97. And what happened was the patient had been in the hospital, had the band placed, was sent home with the family. Uh, the patient had been having some reflux symptoms, and six weeks postoperatively died from a GI bleed attributed to binge eating. So these are, this is a restrictive experience in prader willi syndrome. Now, malabsorptive experience, starting in 1980. I put both the gastric bypass and gastroplasty patients for Anderson in the same or in, uh, to the same category, but I divided them up, and I've already covered that. In 83, Touquet did jejunal ileal bypass. I know he did three prader willi patients. I did talk to one of the parents who had, whose child had the bypass done in 1976. Out of those three patients that were published, um, they all had serious complications. Two of them died uh, within a year. One of them had a wound infection with a DVT and pulmonary embolus. I suspect some of this is due to mal complications of malabsorption. In 91, Laurent and Jacquard uh, did, published a series of biliopancreatic diversion. The end of those patients was seven. There was weight regain in six years, and there were significant complications from vitamin and mineral deficiencies. For those in the audience that don't know, prader willi syndrome is a high risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia. So you are making someone malabsorbed who already is at risk for, for osteoporosis and osteopenia. So this would be very serious for them to the point that the patient had spinal fractures. In 2000, Grugney et al. published a series of biliopancreatic diversion patients. Again, same theme, weight loss and gain with nutrition complications. Uh, Marinari, series of five patients, weight loss and gain at two years of 20% of the weight. Two out of the five patients died from an unrelated cause. There was no nutrition information to tell you what the outcomes were beyond two years. In 2005, Dale Meetup were pu published three patients for biliopancreatic diversion. Again, same theme, initial weight loss. They were only followed for a short period of time, one to two and a half years. Uh, they had two patients there. There was diarrhea in both with fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies documented in one and anemia in the other. Then in 2010, Marceau et al. published a series of nine patients with prader willi syndrome in addition to another series of 15 patients that were adolescents that went through biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. The entire population was followed out to 10 years, and he reported that uh, biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch was a success in prader willi syndrome, but he did not run any statistics. We ran the statistics, and when you ran the stats for the prader willi patients versus the controls, there was a weight loss followed by regain, which was very significant in the prader willi patients with a P of 0.005, and if you figure that there's weight regain, there's probably going to be less of a change in BMI. The BMI changed minus 3 for the prader willi patients versus minus 30 for the controls. And the length of stay for the initial procedure was far longer in the prader willi patients, 16 days versus 5, mainly due to complications of the surgery as well as adrenal insufficiency that was unrecognized. And out of the three, uh, three of the patients, 
that had longer term data had a revision of the biliopancreatic diversion and an additional patient uh, died four years post-op from complications from the reversion. The ones that had a revision of the biliopancreatic diversion were to make them malabsorb even more. And there was not great nutrition data on bone mineral density for these patients. So I'm not trying to be the grim reaper, but I don't think it sounds too good. And I'm sorry, Dr. Inge, in the back. Okay, so if we actually look at some more controlled data that we have, here's five-year data for some patients that were some series that were bold enough to give you uh, the prouder willy versus obese control, five years. Here's gastric bypass, and what you can see, this is percent of weight loss. Uh, at five years for the obese controls, they had 10% excess weight loss, prouder willy essentially 1% or no weight loss for, for the operation. For vertical band and gastro gastroplasty, for the obese controls, there was 25% excess weight loss at five years. For the prouder willy patients, they were pretty smart. If you see the prouder willy patient, you know and they actually had gained 5% five, five of the weight over their preoperative weight. Okay, so sleeve gastrectomy. Now, um, there's been a total of 11 patients reported, and here is the data in prader willi syndrome. There's a 17-year-old girl from China who had a clinical diagnosis of prader willi syndrome based on major and minor criteria, no genetic testing performed. The patient had type 2 diabetes, at, a one, at 15 months post-op, the BMI had improved from 46 to 33, in addition to some improvement in glucose tolerance. The A1C had dropped from 7 to 5.9. Second patient's reported is 8 years old. 8 years old with a history of obstructive sleep apnea, psoriasis, impaired glucose tolerance. BMI went from 56 to 40. At 9 months post-op, the psoriasis reportedly improved. I don't know if that's skin picking. I have no idea. I didn't think psoriasis would improve the bariatric surgery, but I could be wrong. And the glucose tolerance also improved. Then there were two patients, uh, ages 15 and 23, out of a series from Till et al., who had a pre-op BMI of 46 to 50, had mild to moderate sleep apnea, and had 50% excess weight loss at two years. Again, looks reasonable, but small number and two years data. And the last one is the paper by al et al. that was just published in Annals of Surgery in September. There were nine patients in there out of a series of 100 adolescents that underwent sleeve gastrectomy. Out of those nine, there, I mean, or out of the 100, there are nine that we're interested in here. There were seven patients with prader willi syndrome, two patients with Barnet beetle. Unfortunately, the quality of the long-term data is very minimal, especially for those disorders of hyperphagia. The only thing that they referenced was that one of the prader willies was five years old. Five. Everybody hear that? Five. Okay, five-year-old had prader willi syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, with recurrent episodes of, am I right? Okay, sorry, I'll talk, I'll talk faster. Okay, I usually don't run long. Um, prader willi syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea with current life-threatening events. They had data at one year post-op for that patient. The patient's BMI had dropped from uh, 31 to 22. No, no further data beyond that and none for the other disorders. The bib. Um, the bib is placed endoscopically. In, in addition to that, you use a hypocaloric diet with proton pump inhibitor and a dancitron. Uh, 21 patients were, had, 12 patients had 21 of these procedures pla or balloons placed. Median age was 19 years. Uh, five patients had more than one bib placement, um, and one un underwent uh, biliopancreatic diversion after the third bib. So the outcomes that were published by the investigators looked promising during the bib, although there wasn't that great of a response. Uh, BMI dropped from 47 to 41, which was significant. SDS also improved. There was a decrease both in, in fat mass and lean body mass. If you look at the impact of the serial bib procedures, which they advocated this as well for patients that needed help, you can see for all these patients, there's actually a learning curve. Every time they get a place, they get smarter. This is the percent of BMI change with number one. Look, ah, for, especially look at number one and number two. They drop their BMI by 10 and 14. You go to the second time, no change for number one. Number two, cut it down to 10. By the time you get to the third bib, there's really no improvement because the patients, I think, either have become accommodated to the bib or they figured out how to eat around it. The complications are significant in this. There was a patient that died due to gastric perforation three weeks after it was placed. There was another patient who um, had what looked like necrosis and had a large phytobezar. Um, the complication rate for BIB in Prader-Willi was 4 out of 21. 
in comparison to the general population of 71 out of 2,500 with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. Okay, in other disorders, some of this has been covered, but I'll hit very quickly. In Barde Beetle, there was a 16-year-old at a BMI of 53. Three and a half years post-op, the BMI was down to 34. There was no further weight loss beyond year two. This only went out that far, but that looked pretty good. And the land court receptor deficiency was already covered by Christian, so I'll pass on that. Uh, and hypothalamic obesity has already been covered. So I think if you actually go to the other thing that's not really been hit on very much is supervised diet and exercise in prouder Willie. There are several case reports and anecdotal experience, including a patient that I'm familiar with that had the highest BMI I've ever seen, which was 93 and walking. She was 15, she had OSA, her lips were purple. Uh, she had been going to the emergency room for asthma. I think it was because she had undetected corporal manel, had NAFLD. She was hospitalized for four months. Um, at her, her BMI discharge was 70, and the family was trained on diet and restriction. Five years post-op, I mean, post-admission, her BMI was 33 and stable. Never had surgery, OSA resolved. This was just diet and exercise, the training of the family. That doesn't happen a lot. But it does show some benefit, and this was published. And there's some data that's been published by Schmidt et al. showing early dietary intervention avoids long-term obesity in prouder Woolly with an improvement in SDS for BMI versus controls at 10 years. So in summary, the data on bariatric procedures and hyperphagic disorders, a lot of things have been tried and reported predominantly in prouder Woolly syndrome. The existing data shows poor long-term results post-procedures in prouder Woolly syndrome, but the data is very limited, as I've already mentioned. And there's limited data in the other hyperphagic disorders. It's been mentioned before, and I think people, I'm not speaking to the choir here, further data is needed with detailed information on the existing bariatric patients, in addition to long-term data with cost analysis uh, for medical and dietary management, in addition to the cost of the repeated surgeries. I can only recommend for now a non-bariatric approach through the use of caloric restriction, supplementation, exercise, and supervision. And I can't say that it is with respect to bariatric surgery that one size fits all. And I will stop there. Thank you. Hopefully this wasn't too negative.